Welcome to this week's BizDev at Auckland session. Tonight, I'm really pleased to introduce Stephen Witherden, who is the Product Strategy Manager at Becker, with a particular interest in all things digital, which will be great. Both Stephen and I are very much looking forward to your questions, so don't hesitate at any stage to drop your questions into chat, and I'll make sure that I pose them to Stephen. So thank you very much, and welcome, Stephen. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Guy. It's great to be here. So let's kick straight off into some questions, if that's okay. Let's let's just broadly talk about you know what Becker's all about. What does what does Becker do? Well, well thank you. So uh, Becker is a professional services consultancy with an engineering pedigree of 100 years. We're a New Zealand-owned, uh, employee-owned organisation uh, that was started by a chap called George Becker um, more than 100 years ago. We have engineering disciplines. Uh, we work across 75 different disciplines, including engineering, so everything from mechanical, electrical chemical, um, civil engineering, through to project management, um, um, things like uh, project delivery and um, and the likes. Um, and we, we want to be trusted advisors to our clients. So um, our job is to advise our clients on their challenging problems. And typically their challenging problems have something to do with their asset portfolio. Our clients tend to be clients with large complex asset portfolios, such as government or infrastructure clients or um, industry and we help them imagine what the future might be and help them bring their future into being. Now, good examples of that are the Waterview Tunnel or the Auckland Future Plan um, for growth in 2050. Great, great. And I think we should dig into some of those examples a little bit. Obviously, you know, not um, talking about anything that's commercially sensitive. But bef before we do that, let's dive a little bit more into your, your yourself, your role, because obviously you don't do all those things at, at Becker. What, what, what's your background and then what's your particular focus there as product strategy Thank you, manager? Sir. So you may have uh, figured it out from my accent, but I was born in South Africa um, uh, back in 1979. That makes me 42 years old. I moved to New Zealand when I was 18, and um, moving from South Africa to New Zealand was quite a, a culture shock for me, and I fell in love with the country. I, I, all I knew when I moved to New Zealand was that there was a, country, that there was a city called Auckland, and <laughs> Auckland had a University of Auckland, and I, that was what I was going to do, was going to the University of Auckland. I went to the University of Auckland, studied information systems and operations research, graduated with a, um, an honours degree in information systems, um, wrote my dissertation, honours dissertation in decision support. And I actually worked as the lead software engineer for software developer for CECL, because um, University of Auckland's learning management system um, back in the day from about 2001 to 2003. Um, I then left university to join Becker in, in uh, 2005 at the age of 25. Um, and I've had many roles within Becker. I went to Texas to work on the P3 Orion projects. I've worked on simulation projects. I've been with Becker throughout our journey as um, an engineering firm, uh, classically, who then had some software developers. We weren't allowed to call ourselves software engineers. We called ourselves software developers. Uh, when I joined the company, we had the CRT monitors, and I had a mouse with a ball in it. Uh, <laughs> and we went from a small team doing in-house development to a team delivering software projects for our clients to a team that built SaaS or software as a service solutions for our clients, and now to a team that's doing um, products for our clients as well. So I'm really proud to have been a part of that journey. Um, when I left the university and uh, when I was you know, tender age of 25, looking for the old sort of organization I wanted to work for, um, because I love New Zealand so much, I wanted to work for a company that was a strong New Zealand business owned by New Zealand, selling its services overseas, because I wanted to contribute to New Zealand and, and the GDP. Um, and I had a decision to make, would I choose a large organization um, and try to work my way up or a small organization? And so the way I thought about it is I thought, well, um, I could either find a seedling and stand on the seedling and hope for it to grow. I could climb my own seedling. Um, I could climb a relatively um, strong tree or find the biggest tree I could find and climb yeah. that. And so I, took, I found the biggest tree. Um, in the grand scheme of things, Becker uh, internationally is not that big. But we're a 3,500 strong business by New Zealand standards. We're quite big and I think the largest engineering firm um, in the country. Great. I'm, I'm definitely going to dive in, into more of your stories with Becca. But first, I'd like to just hook right back to that little um, anecdote uh, from your early time um, in Auckland University. Um, you mentioned Cecil, which for anyone, mm. um, any of the students out there, Cecil was university development that preceded Canvas. It was actually developed in-house by the university and Steam was part of it. So can you tell us a little bit about that? So I think I was second generation Cecil. 
And um, the, the name came from um, Don Sheridan, who was the professor who was at the core of this. Um, the, the system was actually originally called CSL or Computer Supported Learning. But because Don's uh, Canadian, he had this accent and he would say Cecil. And so it just became Cecil. It, 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 it had its own character. Um, and we, we built it from the ground up um, in Delphi, those of you who are interested in software engineering, um, based on an access database that David White um, built back in the day. Um, and I have fond memories. So I, I, that was one of my first jobs. And I was the lead developer for a period of time. And I made the mistake. I made many mistakes in that role. One of them was I thought uh, as the lead developer, I had to be the best software developer, which is not true. The lead developer creates an environment where everyone else can be their best. Um, but I thought I had to be the best, and I, I stressed myself out a lot trying to deliver a really good quality product. Um, one of the things I learned at Cecil was the difference between technical excellence and uh, client driving client outcomes. Mm. So um, I, um, as a software engineer, I, I'm a software engineer by trade. I love writing good code. And I said to, to the bosses, I said to uh, Don and them, I need two months. I need to rewrite the whole thing. It's rubbish uh, from the ground up. I, I need some time to stabilize our, our core product. And so I did that. They gave me two months, which is a real luxury. And I redid that. And I realized two things. One was that because I was so careful with the way I did my work, it didn't change the customer's experience or the user's experience of the system. So despite that effect that it made me feel better and I did all this work, the customer's experience was unchanged. Hmm. Um, and it was a bit disappointing to me. Um, and secondly, I realized that I wasn't finished, that I could spend the rest of my life improving the excellence of the technical part of the solution without ever improving the customer's experience. And so I realized then there's always, there always has to be a balance to these things. You can't have too much technical debt, which is the term we use for things that are shortcuts or, or um, issues with the way we've developed our, our solutions, uh, because the technical debt prevents us from making improvements and can cause issues such as security issues or um, performance issues. However, at the same time, we can't overlook um, achieving those client outcomes because that's what we're there for is to actually add value. I know it sounds like a very businessy thing to say, but that's what we try to do. Absolutely, no, it's true. Can you just just um, give a quick um, account of what um, technical debt means for anyone who's not a, a software um, experienced in, in the in the student audience? Yeah, so an example of technical debt is you're you're trying to um, build a system to to calculate someone's salary, um, and you know that you probably should take into account um, tax varying tax rates. But you know that the tax rate's about 11% presently. And you go, you know what? I'm just going to hard code the tax rate 11% because it hasn't changed recently and it probably won't change too much in the future. That assumption, the tax rate's going to remain 11%, is an example of technical debt. It's probably fine for now. But in a few years' time, it may not be a valid assumption. It's those sorts of shortcuts that we make deliberately. Um, and the reason we use the term technical debt is it's kind of like we're borrowing from the future. We're saying, we're going to take a shortcut now. Um, and we won't invest now because we'll invest later on to change that. Um, and I think when we think about technical debt, we, we need to be mindful that it is a choice. It's not just something that happens by accident. And we need, we need to recognize that debt and then pay it down. And maybe we don't ever have to pay that debt. Maybe the tax rate doesn't change, which is fine. And that's why we have to, we, we have another term in software. Sorry, this is not supposed to be a software engineering course. No, no, please, it's um, good. Called, called YAGNI. So YAGNI um, stands for you ain't going to need it. And what we mean by that is actually software engineers like myself, we love to build, we're abstract thinkers. We love to abstract a problem out to its constituent parts. And so we like to genericize things. That's uh, what I love to do. However, if you try genericize things too much, you end up investing too much in those generic things and not actually on the value. Because at the end of the day, if you calculate some salary, people aren't too concerned about changing tax rates. They're probably more concerned about um, the reliability and speed of the system as opposed to the flexibility at that early stage. Mm. And I guess we might be able to revisit some of that later when we talk about um, some of the processes you adopt, the agile process you adopt, because I'm guessing that can be Absolutely. taken into account. Great. Let, let's hold that thought. So um, I'd like to start taking the discussion into what you do at Becker. Uh, in, in the lead in to there, you know, you, you, the silly things that, that drive you uh, professionally, passions you have for delivering delivering great great technical solutions. Can you tell us a little bit about those passions and, and, and how you brought them into Becker and, and how that's honed your own personal kind of ambitions to be a developer and a product strategist? Yeah, so one of the great um, joys of working for a company like Becker is every year the role is slightly different. 
because I work with talented, really high, um, very expertise-driven people in an organization with 75 different disciplines, um, every year I, I learn something new. So I've learned about how earthquakes work. We have people in our business who can look at a building and tell you that building is going to fall down and that building is not. Uh, we have people who can tell you whether or not your, your piping is, is good or bad based on just the look of it or based on some, some data. Um, and so I've therefore learned stuff from industries ranging from defense through to infrastructure, um, which has been wonderful. Um, I love problem solving. I love R&D. I love being creative. And for me, software is one of the most creative environments because uh, when you develop software, the result of that is immediately apparent. So it's not, you don't have to wait a year for your building to be built. The software is built right then and there. Um, so my role of product strategy manager has, is quite recent. It's only happened in the last a couple of years. And uh, that was as a result of us realizing that um, a lot of our software solutions were taking expertise from our engineers, so it's, be it electrical uh, or mechanical or seismic expertise, and putting it into a software solution and delivering that value to our clients. And the way I see Becker is Becker is uh, an, a, a firm that delivers expertise from, from the minds of our great people. Um, and so part of my job is to take that expertise and package it up into a software solution so we can deliver that expertise at scale. So how do we scale it out? How do we deliver more value uh, for less hours? Um, and so I really enjoy working with these with these bright people in the you know at the top of their game, um, and it, it's that's really what what drives me. Um, I've bought into Bicker, so the Bicker, um vision statement of creative people. Um, striving together to transform our world, um, as well as our, our mission, which is to make every day better. And we use that term every day to mean not just every single day, but also to make the every day better. Because um, based on the sorts of projects we do, um, the work we do impacts on everyone's lives, be it anything from clean drinking water to the infrastructure to, to ice cream. And I, I do work with clients that make ice cream, which is quite fun. <laughs> Do you get free ice cream? <laughs> I don't get free ice cream. I do get free um, free uh, soft drink, though, which is <laughs> <Good>. nice. <laughs> um, so um, you, you've talked um, in, in the past when we've spoken before about being a bit of a pioneer in your role as, as product strategy manager. So I'm, 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 I'm guessing that means that basically you've, you've led the development of your own path through Becker. You've shaped your role and kind of led. led tell, tell us a bit, bit about that process and that pathway that you went on. Yeah, so um, as one, so I'm part of a relatively new part of, of Becker, um, you know, with a 100-year-old pedigree. Um, when I first joined Becker, we weren't allowed to call ourselves software engineers because, you know, that wasn't a real engineering discipline. Um, and so we were software developers. And over the course of my career at Becker, which is 18 years now, we've been accepted to be um, uh, fully-fledged engineers. As a part of that, I was made a um, technical fellow for software engineering, which means I'm the, one of the most senior software engineers in our business. Um, and I was the first technical fellow for software engineering at Becker. So in many respects, I'm a pioneer. I've been the first. Um, I'm, I'm the first, the one and only um, product strategy manager as well. And what that means is that it's really hard to know whether I'm doing the right thing. It's I can't look at another person in the business and say, I'm going to be like them. I'm going to follow in their footsteps. I have to create that part for everyone else. Mm. And what I've learned is, as part of that, my job is to point towards our, our North Star, mm -hmm. not to define the North Star because one person can't possibly create that strategy of what the future looks like, but to be part of defining what that North Star is and then hold my hand as steady as I can and point to that North Star. One thing I've found is that um, if you want change to happen and, and digital is all about creating change, uh, you have to point to that change for about three years and be consistent in your message for three years before the change will happen. And, and tell me a bit about your, your team. Who do you work with? Do you have, have your own team or is it very much cross-functional? Cross, uh, so I, I am sort of one of a kind. I don't have any team uh, beneath me. I work directly with our chief digital officer, Thomas Hyde. I'm very privileged to work with him. Mm. And I work um, alongside pe um, people in our digital space. So, so um, digital transformation with people like John Williams, um, com the commercial side of the business, the products and services part of the business, and our ICT team. And we've done that on purpose because we've realized that all of these different parts of our business, although somewhat separate, benefit from each other. So products, that my focus, benefits from having the products and services team, which can build the products, um, also benefits from the ICT team who support the infrastructure that the products run on, um, also benefits from digital transformation, which is looking to actually transform the way Becker works. 
So we're trying to simultaneously change the way Becker thinks about ourselves and transform the way we do our work, as well as transforming the way in which we deliver our services to our customers, as well as creating whole new services for our customers through digital, um, which is which is super exciting. So um, I work directly with um, our products team. So we have a, um, a team of software engineers, mostly in Auckland, although we have software engineers around the world um, in Australia um, here as well, um, and, and in other parts of New Zealand. Um, and we have, uh, the way we're structured is, is every single um, product or um, digital enterprise has its own founder. That's the, sort of like the entrepreneur that's created this idea of the product um, and their own head of technology. So we have several products. We've got Beacon for earthquake monitoring, Beatune for building energy efficiency, Maestro, which is also for energy efficiency, but for compressors in a manufacturing context, Frankly AI, which is conversational AI for um, underserviced communities, Facility Twin, which is our digital twin for operations um, platform, CapEx Insights, which is for capital project management, and Hawkeye for computer vision for identification and condition assessment for assets. So they will take the expertise of our, of our people and capture it into technology. And they all have their own head of technology and their own founder in their own way. Some of them are a lot more mature than others, and so they'll have their own um, marketing team, they'll have their own business analysis team, and they'll have their own customer success team but they all share typically um, the same uh, uh, software team to deliver those software solutions. Yeah, that, that great, great. So you're pretty much involved in all aspects digital. Is that is Would that be fair to say? Yeah, so I have my own accountability. So yeah. I'm very much accountable for the products part, but I the way I see it is it's very much a matrix and I support the other parts of the business. So for example, yeah. Uh, we might have a product such as Hawkeye, which is great for, um, but which we offer to our clients for um, computer vision for identifying a condition of, of assets. And we'll use it internally to transform the way in which we're doing um, transport and, and infrastructure projects. Um, so that's kind of how that works. Um, and by collaborating in that way, it, it, can, it, it can be very beneficial. Yeah. Um, we made a conscious effort to, um, sort of riffing a bit here, we made a conscious effort two decades ago to turn our internally focused software engineering team into a, a profit center rather than a cost center. So many organizations, they might have a software team that's a cost center. Uh, we turned ourselves into a profit center because we wanted to hold ourselves accountable um, and we wanted to keep ourselves lean and hungry, um, which is, is a challenge because it means that you have to be making money all the time. You have to be um, concerned about profitability of work, but it also means you tend to focus on where the value is um, rather than um, I don't want to say getting lazy, but rather than getting focused on the wrong sorts of problems. That's that's really interesting. Um, what are the tensions there? Do you find there are tensions in terms of um, staying focused on the value to the client whilst also trying to manage manage the bottom line in those kind of you know, mini projects or you know internal accountabilities? How does it? Yes, actually, it like it's, in practice? It's, hmm. it's really good. You should say that. So it relates back to the CSL question. Um, when I think about the sorts of things we do in the product space. I think about R&D, research development. I think of product development, which is building the product itself. I think of operations and maintenance or support. Um, I, I think of delivery, which is delivering solutions for our clients for their, for their customer success. Um, and um, as I said before, typically it's the same team that's doing all those different things. Um, and there's two parts of that that can find themselves in conflict. So product development is very much focused on building a quality product, making sure it's, it's uh, rock solid, that there's good security, that it's scalable, that it's reliable, and that we genericize, as I said before, as much as possible so we can sell in many different environments. Delivery, however, is focused on satisfying that particular customer need right now. Hmm. And so delivery tends to have short-term goals and are trying to deliver value to clients right now. And products has got, typically got longer-term goals and trying to, um, trying to invest. And th there's two problems that you come up with this. One is structural in that um, we, Becker, are moving away from being a services-led mm. organization to being a services and products organization. So we're not abandoning services, we're just adding products in. And what that means is that we have to um, invest up front. So a, a product business has to invest up front, um, and then the, the cash comes later, whereas a, a, a services business gets the cash as you, as you deliver your services. Um, so that's one problem. The other problem is that um, that, that, that you need to change. You need to be focused on your priorities. So the priorities of delivery and conflict sometimes are the priorities of product. 
and um, balancing those priorities is quite challenging. Mm. Uh, we tend to use Agile, which mm -hmm. is a really good way of exposing some of those conflicts and those priorities. But because it is the same team, um, we rely heavily on our, our people, the quality of our people, to just make the right decisions, which is really stressful for them. Um, and in time, I'm hoping Phil will grow a bit more and we'll be able to um, make those um, conflicts more visible and easier to manage rather than relying on our great people. Yeah, and that's great. And, and I'm, I'm guessing that's the transformation that you're you're leading. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it, it's it's quite a difficult transformation um, because, as I said, we have built our reputation on our 100 years mm. pedigree with our clients, being trusted advisors to our clients, being the people with the right answers. And our, our clients can can trust that they can take it to the bank. Um, and when we come in, and when Stephen turns up with his with his pointy shoes on and says, "Hey, we'd like to buy some software with that." Um, it's reasonable that our clients would say, how can you be objective when selling the software to me? How can you be the trusted advisor and also be pushing the solution? Now, I believe we can. There are many organizations that do this. However, we have to, um, A, have the confidence ourselves that we can do that. And we need to B, have, have those authentic conversations with our clients to make sure that we are adding that value and that we're not tarnishing our one at years pedigree by trying to, to push a software solution on them. Hmm. So um, does that suggest that the products you're trying to develop and sell broadly, are, are, are they one size fits all or are they, they customised and tailored for the client needs still? Do you, do you balance it that way? Oh, that's a very good question. So um, we've, we've been through quite a journey with this. So um, sort of in the middle, in our, in our teens, in this particular um, journey, we would very much go bespoke. So it would go to our client and we'd say, right, we'll just take the smarts of our people and we'll deliver a solution for you um, that, that does this in a novel way. Um, we're now moving towards trying to build platforms that allow us mm. to um, leverage those platforms to deliver faster. Um, and that has many benefits to us. It's cheaper, it's more reliable. Um, we can start from a branding perspective, we can say, hey, we've got this technology. So our digital twin platform, that's my obsession at the moment. So my colleagues, if they're listening to this, will roll their eyes because <laughs> this is something, I've been going on about digital twins for about, five years now. Um, so a digital twin is a high fidelity representation of a real world thing, which looks like, behaves like, and is connected to the real world for decision making. And it relates to my honest dissertation that I did you know, two decades ago about yeah. decision making. Mm. Um, but it also relates to the expertise of our people because digital twins are a good way of understanding complex information. And um, most of what we do at Becker is dealing with complex information and helping. If you think about when an engineer designs a factory, what they're doing is they're taking what's in their head and they're, and they're representing it in a design, a 3D model or 2D model or this Excel spreadsheet in a way that our clients can then understand and then make a decision. Okay, I'm gonna build a factory like this, I'm gonna build a factory like that, I'm gonna not build a factory at all. Um, digital twins, I firmly believe, are going to be the way in which that complex information is understood by people in the future. So therefore, um, it behoves us to have a platform which allows us to deliver digital twins. Now, we're not doing that just from the ground up. We, we obviously work with partners. So we work closely with, with partners like Microsoft, Autodesk, IBM, Bentley, um, a little bit of Amazon, um, because there's no one size fits all. Um, and so, so that's it's been actually really great in merging those things together and coming up with a platform that allows our engineers and our um, other professionals in our business to take their expertise and, and deliver it to their clients in new ways. Mm. That, that, I'd like to dive into that um, digital twin a little bit more. You talk about partners sure. such as IBM, et cetera, Microsoft. So um, I guess cloud-based cloud providers, that kind of thing. I'm, I'm guessing though, to build that kind of um, platform and solution or product for, for clients, you need a lot of data. So where do you get a lot of data from to build a digital twin? How, how does that work? Again, without you know betraying oh. any confidences, but. That's, so that's that's a really great question. So um, for, the, for, the, for one part, uh, I'm pleased to say that actually Becker originates a lot of this data for our clients. So um, not to tell too many stories, but um, a lot of the work we do is design work. So you might design a bridge, we got design a factory or design a road. Um, we have had situations where clients come back to us and say, you remember that, that factory you designed for us like a decade ago, you still have the designs for that because we kind of lost them. So um, in many respects, we have 100 years worth of data about engineering and other disciplines that pertain to our clients. And one of the things I'm interested in doing is helping us unlock that value 
for our clients. So if you think about AI, so AI is a is a brain. It's you, you know you everyone's used ChatGPT and those sorts of technologies now. Um, you can teach an AI. Just imagine a, imagine a, an AI is a pretty competent grad, um, and you can feed it a bunch of data and get it to do stuff for you. Um, it's knowing what data to feed it and knowing what good looks like that is the value. Hmm. Like IBM, Microsoft, Amazon, everyone's got some sort of AI brain, but what's missing is the data to teach it. Um, and uh, not to overstate it, but I think we've got a lot of that. And um, the other place where the data comes from is reality capture. So um, using technologies like laser scanning, um, um, reality capture technologies, even 360 cameras, we can capture the real world and use that information in part of the twin. And obviously in real time systems and even asset management systems for our clients. So our clients really have, one of the sad realities for many of our clients, and I tend to work a lot in the manufacturing and defense space, a lot of the information they need to make their decisions, they already have. They just don't have the information in the hands of the people who need it to make the decision. So if I'm um, a factory worker and I'm making ice cream, which I love, <laughs> um, and I, I want to know how to reduce the energy um, consumption of my plant. How do I know which knob to twiddle at what time? Now, that information exists somewhere, but I just don't have access to it at the time that I'm there on the factory floor. Um, or to know where to go on the factory um, to prevent a health and safety issue. Um, that stuff exists. Um, and so part of what we're interested in doing is taking that information wherever it lives in the organization, applying our engineers' great expertise to it and making it available to decision makers. Everyone from you know the CEO through to the, the person who's um, planning their route for cleaning. Fantastic. Um, you, you mentioned um, ways of capturing data using AI, et cetera. I did notice on uh, in one of your company brochures, um, uh, uh, um, so augmented reality and virtual reality being used to actually capture that kind of data. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? So I can. So um, augmented reality. So in my opinion, AR and VR are kind of like BAU now, or they should be BAU. It's not an innovative technology anymore. I've got friends who don't have a TV; they just have VR, right? And um, I'm a little bit skeptical of the likes of the metaverse. And so, a, a very brief aside: um, uh, one of the things that makes me cautious about metaverse with a capital M is you look at the Web 3.0. Um, language that people use around NFTs and blockchain and all that. My concern around all that is I think it's looking to try capture the commons of this digital world. I, I believe that we are on the verge of, if not already, creating a digital digital world, um, a, a, a digital commons that we can all participate in. And I worry that if we're to uh, if we try to uh, introduce scarcity into that world, we will miss out on the great opportunities that, that they have for us. But setting that, that concern aside, um, we use AR and VR to visualize um, designs, for example. So a client might, um, I've actually seen this happen and it's, it's, it's really fantastic to see. You, look, we were designing a, a factory for a client um, and you show the 3D model to the operators and you say, right, this is how you can, this is where the, the, the valve is, you can turn. And they're not really too interested and they kind of struggle to understand the 3D model, even though it's in 3D. You put them into VR, and I'm talking. I'm not talking like people in their twenties. I'm pe talking people in their fifties who've been in the in the factory for ages, and they'll go, "I can't use that valve." And you'll say, "Well, why not?" And they'll say, "Well, look how look how low it is. Um, I can't bend. I can't bend that low to to use that valve. But you need to move it." Or they'll say, "I can't fit through that gap. Uh, you know, in that in between those those walls, you need to make that wider." And so, one of the one of the lessons from all that is context. If we can bring more context to people, to decision makers, um, we're not going to be using computers with a keyboard and mouse in the in the not too distant future. We're going to be having much more interactive engagements with computers. And so, by using technologies like AR and VR, we can have more um, engaging experiences for people. Um, in the AR space, we use AR for uh, remote site inspections or remote um, remote inspections of um, of construction or, or um, verification activities where during COVID we couldn't fly remotely to go inspect something. So someone put the headset on and they had inspected. That's becoming BAU in much the same way as like when mobile phones first came out, everyone was excited about the opportunities for that. And now everyone's got a camera and a microphone um, and a computer in their pockets.
it's just bare you and it's going to be the same for ar and vr so we don't see or i don't see us necessarily innovating in that space i see us let's just be a you to use ar and vr um to deliver value for our clients um in the safe is one of our products that integrates with our digital twin for example which is uses vr for health and safety briefing so you can you can walk around the site do a virtual tour around the site and identify hazards um and it's amazing even though it's not a real representation of the real world, it's not, not as interactive as the, as the real world um, you remember um, because um, because it was ex experiential. Mm. Mm. So what, what also is interesting there is I think you're talking about using um, AR and VR as part of your products and solutions when you're working with, with these clients, but at the same time you're also using that to feed back into your own design processes in some ways. Is that correct? Absolutely. So um, like I said, we we use digital to transform our own business um, to make ourselves more efficient we use digital to become have better a better intimate relationship with our clients mm. um, to deliver new kinds of services to our clients and to improve our customers experience so it, it touches all these different things and although i'm focused on products which is you know the new products and services part um i inter interface with all those other things if we if we develop a cool ar solution that can be used internally to improve our customer experience, uh, employee experience, as well as um, automation. Great, great. So we started to touch on the customers and we've got a broad sense of, of, of who those are, but um, can you give, a, we, again, without betraying any confidentiality, an example of the sorts of clients you work with, but then also digging a bit deeper, who are the contact points that, that you and your team have within those organizations to be able to implement these sorts of solutions and work in this way? So um, we, we look for bold collaborators who are looking to make use of every resource wisely. Th those are the, the core clients we're looking for in our, in our product space. Um, typically, we're looking for clients with large scalable problems. So um, they, they tend to be multinationals. So they'll be government clients. They might be defense clients. They might be um, clients with large asset portfolios like um, in, you know, real estate. Um, or they might be manufacturing. And so we work with those clients looking to help them make use of every resource wisely, be it um, something like Beechune for energy efficiency or Maestro for energy efficiency of the, the compressors, for example, when making ice cream, um, or, or for um, using digital twins to, to do things like preventative maintenance or predictive maintenance, um, you know, work site planning and those sorts of things. Um, because of our engineering pedigree, um, and, and the minor we have in that space, we typically find ourselves talking to um, the engineering part of the business, so the site engineer or the, the, the chief engineer in the organization. We do try to talk to decision makers like the finance team um, or the CEO if we can, if we can talk to them, because um, what I've learned is that it takes a blend of people in an organization to deliver digital transformation. And what we're trying to do, we're trying to introduce some technology to help transform the business. So you need the, the, the engineer who has the problem um, and the operations team who are going to use the solution. You need the innovation manager or the transformation digital transformation person who um, whose job it is to drive that innovation to the business and do the transformation. You need the person with the money, um, the decision maker, be it the CEO or the COO or, or what have you, who's going to see it's a worthwhile investment. Yeah. Um, and then you need the implementer or the um, or the ICT team who are actually going to be plugging things in and helping actually manifest that thing on the ground. And if you don't have buy-in from all those people, um, it's not going to work. So you might find that the solution is really desirable um, for the people on the ground and they love it. But actually, if IT if it doesn't fit into the IT network, um, it's just not going to fly. If you can't plug it into to the asset management system, it won't work. Likewise, IT might be really into it, but if it doesn't actually deliver value for the people on the factory floor, they just won't use it. Hmm. So that makes absolute sense. You want all those stakeholders involved and in getting their buy-in. How does that work in practice? I guess in an ideal world, you'd have everyone around this big table, thrash it all out on a two-weekly basis. But, but how do you actually manage those complex relationships when people could be in different buildings, different offices, different time zones? We use a lean startup approach. So we start by saying, well, um, we think we've got something of value to offer. And we go out to our clients and, and we do an experimental approach. So we mm. say, well, okay, let's have our hypothesis. Our hypothesis is this is going to work. And then we um, bring it to the client and say, hey, we think this is going to be of value to you. And 
more often than not, we actually get told, no, it's not got value, and then we, we iterate. So um, failing fast, learning that we've made a mistake, and, and then learning from those, um, we find that um, finding those bold collaborators is absolutely essential. So what I mean by that is we need to find an organization that's willing to co-create with us, that's willing to actually, and it sounds like a platitude, go on the journey with us to say, well, you know, we've got a problem, you've got a solution, um, and we're willing to actually invest in not just to, to buy the solution, but actually to um, to change our organization in the process and bring everyone else along with us for the journey. That's um, That transformation is actually, people underestimate how hard it is. Um, and there's only so much we can do from the outside. It has to come in from, from within. Hmm. So part of it is actually choosing the right organization, uh, waiting for the right moment. Some organizations, we spend three years talking to them about the problems that they have and they, you know, they're not ready. That's fine, we'll wait. Uh, you know, we've been waiting 100 years for this. We, we can wait a few more years until they're ready to um, to invest. Um, and so it, it is an open question. So customer success is really what I think we're talking about here. That is um, a, a huge challenge because it, it, it involves people and all the interesting problems in, in digital involve people. I think it's quite interesting as well, you talk about working with clients for quite a long time, deciding when they're ready. Does that make for some tough business calls when you, you know, you've you invested in a particular opportunity? It may be a client you're already working with anyway in other areas, but if you're then walking away, I mean, there's obviously a big upfront cost there. How, how do the business decisions work there broadly? So it's a really good question. In our case, I think it's partly to do with our, our culture, like growing up in New Zealand, um, we're very much a relationship-driven organization. And so we don't see it as a failure if we're if we're having a conversation with a client and um, we realize that we don't know the right solution for them, we're not gonna try to force the issue, but now we've developed this relationship and actually that relationship has value and we'll still use those relationships to get insights from them. So we'll say, look, Actually, this solution didn't work for you. In fact, none of our products are really what you want, but maybe we can talk about this problem over here. And because we've got this, this, these rich themes of expertise in our business, 75 different disciplines, typically there's something that we want to talk to them about where we can add some value and they can add some value. So um, I, nothing, nothing's ever lost in that sort of conversation. You do have to make some, some difficult calls. And we have, I'm um, pleased to say we've got a very, um, rigorous bid no bid process at Becker. So we, we ask ourselves, I don't even know how many questions they are, um, something like 20 questions. Whenever you're about to enter into um, a piece of work for a client, this was originally designed for our um, services business, but it also works in products. Um, you know, things like cultural alignment, um, you know, value strategy, does this align with our values? Is this what we wanna do? And if it, if it comes out with a low score, we just don't do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that relationship is not, it's not, it's never a waste to develop a relationship with a potential client. Hmm. Great, great. Um, so you mentioned the, the lean startup approach, which kind of leads us into maybe discussing some of your, your project methodologies and project management methodologies. You, you've talked about agile um, earlier on the call. Tell us a bit more about, you know, your choices to do that, maybe how it fits into your, your move to pro a product model and why, why it's working for you and what the challenges are. So Ag Agile is great in that it allows you to surface those conflicts I mentioned before around mm. priorities. So you're able to say, well, these are the priorities from this part of the business, these are the priorities from that part of the business. You can have an open conversation about that. Um, so as I mentioned before, every product has their own head of technology, which is looking at the technology direction of, um, of their product, and I work really closely with them. Um, we also have uh, product managers who manage those products and product owners um, in a very Agile sense, so product owner is a role in Agile, which is looking after the backlog, product backlog and all that. Mm. Um, I consider many of these problems to be so-called wicked problems. So um, a wicked problem is a problem where you don't, you can't understand the solution until you fully understand the problem, but you can't fully understand the problem until you fully understand the solution. So therefore, you have to kind of understand both the problem and the solution at the same time. So design thinking is a methodology we use for coming to grips with that problem solution dichotomy. Um, I'll put my hand up and say, as a software engineer, I tend to jump to the solution too quickly. <laughs> and often the team are telling me, Stephen, slow down. It's not solution time, it's problem time. You need to describe the problem properly. And the best way to do that is, is with empathy. So we have to spend a lot of time 
asking questions. So that's why integ um, not integrity selling. Integrity selling is important, but the uh, lean startup methodology uh, involves a lot of um, asking questions of our clients. What is the pain point? What is really causing you problems? What's keeping you up at night? Um, if, if I had a magic wand and I waved the magic wand for you, what would that do? And I, I recently spoke to a client and I said, if I had a magic wand and I waved it for you, what, what, what would you do? And he, he stared off from the distance and said, I don't know because I don't know what the problem is. Mm. I don't actually know what's causing my manufacturing problem. Mm. And that was his problem because he didn't know what his problem was. And that's something that you can help him with. So once you've understood so that pain with that deep empathy, not just for the the person who's got the problem, but but other people who need to use a solution, you can then start to go down, down your design thinking path to um, ping from the from the problem to the solution to come up with the right answer. Um, that's quite messy. It involves a lot of um, back and forth, which is why agile is quite useful because it hmm. it focuses on interactions between people, um, and then that sort of turns out to be a backlog which the team work through. Um, now, in an ideal world, as I said before, we'd have uh, separate teams for product development and delivery and uh, R and D and all that. Uh, we don't have those separate teams. We've got one team that does it all. Mm. Um, I think in time that'll change. Um, the other thing that I, I'm really passionate about and that I really enjoy is every year we get um, students in uh, from an R and D perspective. Um, some of them from the University of Auckland, and those students will just help us do something wacky. So we'll just say, what if we could just use AI to solve this problem? That we don't don't know if we can solve. <laughs> so those are what I call little tech spikes, which we just investigate something uh, to see what happens. And those R and D things are all about um, failing fast, as I said, trying something new um, with with no sort of expectation it's going to succeed. Uh, whereas the project, that, that, so the product work, you know, you have to deliver, so you can't you can't fail, so to speak. I'm not yeah. sure if I answered the question, but that's no, that that's was. great because you, you mentioned before the tensions between product versus delivery. Um, can you talk a bit more about those? Um, you may already address some of it, but I'm interested to hear. So yeah, um, so just thinking a little bit about about that. So, for example, um, let's let's take the example of the um, the interest the 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 tax rate we talked about before. Mm -hmm. um, so if we're building a product that what was um, a payroll system. Um, the product team might be saying, well, I, I want to make a generic system which allows me to have any exchange rate, uh, any interest rate, and actually have the interest rate vary over time during the course of the year because it, the interest rate might, sorry, the tax rate may not coincide with the, with the, um, you know, the financial year. And in fact, yeah. the financial year and the tax year might start, be slightly different. Um, and so the, so the, the product team are rubbing their hands together thinking, these are all this complexity I'd love to solve and I need to make some PBIs or product backlog items to solve all these problems. Meanwhile, the delivery team is like, I have this client, their tax rate's 13.5%. It's always been 13.5% and I just need to solve this problem. So I just need a text box, which is 13.5% and be done with it. I just need you to change 11 to 13. Um, so how do you resolve that problem? Well, um, you, need to, you need to do just enough investment in the product and you need to be able to anticipate what your future needs might be. And um, the way I like to think about it is, once again, that um, lean startup approach where we're going out to our clients and asking them what they need. And we need to, we're, we're really just doing experiments. So those experiments give us signals from the market to say, well, actually 90% of our clients don't need to change the tax rate. Hmm. And so in this case, we don't need all that complexity. It would be lovely to have the complexity, but actually the real pain point is They'd like to change the the color of the buttons because actually some people are color blind and at the moment the colors are not working for color blindness and so we need to have a different theme so we can support color blindness um so it's being able to separate out the good the good quality technical solution which is truly the right answer from a technical perspective and separate it out from the client outcome you're trying to achieve and software is one of those things where there's no other discipline where halfway through the work you're doing, the client will say, well, you know that thing I told you I wanted? I actually wanted completely the other way around. So no one would ever say to a civil engineer, you know, I want you to build the open type of bridge. And halfway through the design of it, they say, well, I, I want it to be a footbridge and a rail bridge and take bicycles. Oh, and by the way, I want it to actually have three off-ramps 
and one of them needs to be going um, to Hamilton, please. Hmm. Like that, that doesn't happen. But in software, that happens all the time. So understandably, the, um, the technical team are trying to anticipate all of these different things. And so part of my job is helping the, tech, the heads of technology balance the, us anticipating all those future needs with the signals we're getting from the market, um, which is not easy because you could very easily spend a lot of time building a really beautiful solution that no one uses. And that would be a huge disappointment. <laughs> it, it sounds incredibly complicated. Um, you suggested before that um, AI could offer solutions <laughs> in terms of managing and cutting through some of this complexity. What are your thoughts on that? So AI, um, so I was somewhat blindsided by um, ChatGPT. I think all of us were quite surprised with how powerful it is. Now, we've been investing in a conversational AI for about six years now with um, with IBM Watson and um, uh, GPT-3 with um, with our Frankly AI solution. So very proud of that. Look, Google it, um, Frankly AI. Um, it's, it's used for stakeholder engagement for underserved communities. And so people can chat with the um, AI and it captures a lot of information about what's going on for them. Um, and then we can use um, sentiment analysis to tease out what the core issues are. And then that helps with planning um, and, and future plans for the um, for, for a city or for an organization. So that's very powerful. Yeah. But that's just scratching the surface. Yeah, and yeah. Um, so as I said before, when we're trying to capture our expertise, so my vision for AI would be, I would love to be able to bottle the expertise of our great people into a little little AI. So if you think about Jarvis, so, um, so Tony Stark, you've all watched Iron Man. Uh, so despite the fact that Tony Stark is, uh, is has some problematic things, Tony Stark is an engineer. Um, the only thing I disagree with about the way Tony Stark behaves is that he pretends that engineering is a solo activity. It's not a solo activity. It's not like one person's genius. Uh, it is a combination of people working together. But one thing I do agree with the, with, with those movies is that Jarvis is sitting there supporting the engineer along the way with their work. So I don't believe AI will replace engineers, but I believe AI will be a support, like a co-pilot or a... Uh, a collaborator, like like I said, like a, a talented grad who you have to teach and you have to explain things to, but who once you've explained things to will really ramp up and be able to support you. Uh, one thing, as I said, with Hawkeye, we use AI to automatically identify cracks in pavements or um, the conditions of pipes or the conditions of other assets or the, the um, dispositions of assets. Anything that a human, can be, human being can do with their eyeball um, computer vision can do nowadays um, pretty effectively. And as I said before, the trick is in taking the expertise from our people who knows what good and bad looks like and teaching that to the AI. Um, other places where we're using AI is in um, generative design and automation. So most organizations like ours are looking to automate and generate designs. And I don't think this, this, this doesn't necessarily mean that we stop doing design. What it means is that we get to a different part of the design. So you might generate a bunch of designs and then say, well, these five designs are actually more appropriate for our clients' um, sustainability goals. Mm -hmm. So it allows you to do the next level up of thinking rather than some of the detail. Um, and then finally, um, predictive and prescriptive analytics are on data, be that real-time data or historical data, allowing our clients to make some great decisions. And what's amazed me is you take a large volume of data from a client and you, you process it and you show it to an engineer uh, or a specialist in their field, and they look at the data and they say, oh, that's wrong. Um, the, the such and such is off. And they're just, based on their years of experience, they can do that. And so I'm very interested in how they know that and how can we put that expertise into systems for our clients so they can have that enduring value. Hmm. Um, I don't think the, the AI is going to be able to solve our big ex existential problems because AI is trained on historical data. So AI only knows what we've done in the past. It can't imagine necessarily what might happen in the future. So take, for example, the flooding, which we regrettably had in Auckland. Hmm. No one anticipated what that level of flooding before. No one ever ran a model of that potential future because no one expected it might happen. So we still have to use our own um, innovation, our own um, imaginations to imagine what the future might be so we can benefit from the AI or the modeling and simulation to predict that future. Hmm. Do you anticipate then that as I mean, obviously, you're, you're monitoring this trend, not trend, this 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 change um, in AI and its, its utility closely. How do you imagine 
over time you'll fit it into your business, your business processes, your decision making, as well as your, your, your client solutions. Um, you've invested in people, you've invested in processes that work. How are you going to integrate it into your agile process, for instance? So I think it's already happening. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, once upon a time, our experience of computers is de deterministic, right? So you, you gave it numbers, you gave it data and rules, and data plus rules equals the output. And then you knew the output was good if you knew your rules and your data was good. Um, and then we, we got sort of search engines in the, in the internet and we we're able to scour the internet for, for information. And our job was to deter determine whether the information was reliable. What was the source? Was it the New York Times or was it some other dodgy website was getting the information from? Now with, a, with the advent of AI, it is a um, stochastic process, it's not deterministic. Mm -hmm. By that I mean it's it's random. It generates random text that looks reasonable because it's been trained on such a large amount of data. And because our brains are not deterministic either, we look at the data, we look at the output and go, that looks good. But the result might be wrong. And so um, the big challenge, that there's two big challenges for us with AI. One is that problem of we need to be able to determine whether something is right or wrong, hmm. um, and we can't rely on the process or the input data. We have to um, independently verify the results of that. And secondly, um, as I said before, because it's trained in historical data, it has biases built into it. So hmm. if you take an AI and you train it on um, historically the, the set points for all temperatures around the world in a building, it will bias towards a man's body temperature because historically all buildings have been biased towards a man's body temperature and if we want the future to not be like that we have to actively interfere with the way the ai is giving us the results so um how would that work in in, in an agile sense for us so we could use it to um take so take the all the stories from our clients so if our clients have told us a whole bunch of problems that they have and we could use that to synthesize down so i i've used um ai to take um things people have emailed me to synthesize it and then I've actually asked the AI, what should I do next? And it's given me a very reasonable response. Now, one caveat I should add to, to, to people about this is you need to be concerned with security, sovereignty, and safety when it comes to using conversational AI. And by that, I mean, um, when you're using typically something like ChatGPT, that's actually sending data overseas typically to the US or to Europe. Mm. If your client is a government client or defense client, they will not want you to do that. And so don't just blithely copy paste stuff. It feels right, but don't just blithely copy paste stuff in there. Um, likewise, with safety, even a really carefully curated uh, AI like ChatGPT or um, or Microsoft's Bing, which is recent, recently released re stuff that, like that, um, it may actually say something that's harmful or suggest something that's harmful because it doesn't know the difference between harmful and unharmful, not really. Um, and then finally, security. Um, you don't want to, just generally speaking, even if you had data sovereign within uh, New Zealand or Australia, you don't want to necessarily leak your intellectual property out to competitors. Mm. And so that's why we're working very closely with Microsoft. Microsoft, as you know, have invested heavily in AI. Um, and I think the future for organizations is going to be having their own um, curated, trained uh, organizational AI, which understands their organization, understands all their data, um, and is able to answer questions about their organization, but is limited to the organization, kind of like Jarvis. You don't want, once you've spent all the time training Jarvis, you don't want to just lend that to your competitors. Hmm. I could spend hours on that one topic alone. Stephen, yeah. it fascinates me, and I may well follow up with you at a separate time. Um, we're moving towards the end of the, um, the session, but I've got one final question that I think will be, be relevant for our audience. Um, what, what are the skills that you think are relevant to the future for people involved in product development, uh, project management, uh, the innovation space generally? So um, I kind of touched on this before with the advent of AI, um, and you've probably already heard about this term, so so-called prompt engineering. So prompt engineering is absolutely going to be critical in the future. So that's how do you articulate a question such that you can get the right answer from the AI. It, um, it used to be, um, so when I was younger, I used to read encyclopedias just for fun. Um, and then my boyfriend at the time, when I was in my 20s, downloaded all of Wikipedia onto his iPod um, so that he could win any argument. So he'd have a, um, every answer to every question on Wikipedia on his iPod. Um, <laughs> And now, it, and then when we got mobile phones, we would just ask any question on our mobile phone and get the answer. 
um, in the not too distant future, you'll have an AI in your pocket and you'll be able to get it to answer any question and also intellect with you on what those answers might be. And the skill moves away from crafting a search term to get the answer you want to crafting a prompt to get the answer you want. Hmm. That's going to be quite critical. I really love, um, you know, in the we talk about the distant future, um, Isaac Asimov, who wrote a lot of um, sort of uh, short stories, he admitted the word robotics. Mm. So robotics, he came up with as part of his short stories. I um, mean, he had this character that I, uh, I'm enamored with um, called, called Susan Calvin. So Dr. Susan Calvin is a robot psychologist. Her job was to go in and understand why the robot did the stupid thing. And I believe we are going to have someone like a robot psychologist who is good at asking questions of the AI to understand why it did what it did so that we can improve the answers or we can understand why and we can make better prompts. I think it's going to be really key. Um, I think um, some of the skills that I think we need are old skills that are just um, packaged up in a different way. So critical thinking skills um, and, the, and the ability to understand um, the, the, the inevitable um, tsunami of garbage we're going to get from these these AIs. So you can you really know that a lot of um, websites are just using generated content from AI. So um, as people looking for answers, looking for innovation, we have to be able to be discerning to determine the difference between garbage and not garbage. Um, I think it's actually going to be a huge problem for us in the near future. I'm trying to sift through. So um, Herbert Simon, one of my great heroes, who um, hmm. the, the, the father of some of the decision support stuff I, yeah. I, I think about, um, said that a, um, a wealth of information leads to a, um, a paucity of attention. <laughs> and so he, he came up with this idea of the attention economy. Uh, our attention spans are so short, our ability to understand information is so limited because there's such a large volume of information out there. That's only going to increase. So our ability to discern that becomes ever, ever more important. Um, what else? Um, so the last thing actually relates to, um, so as, as things become more automated, um, as technology starts to eat into the value chain, um, and so, for example, the sorts of work I do, someone can go out there and generate code. Uh, you know, I, I'm a software engineer by trade, that's what I like to do, but someone can generate code nowadays. So what is left for me? Well, it's, it's actually moving closer to the client and understanding the client's needs. So it goes back to the problem I was talking about before, yeah. is that the solutions will come if you can understand the problem. So it's how do you have that, that really um, deep empathy with the person who has the problem? How do you understand that problem really well? How do you engage with those, those stakeholders, take them along with you for the journey so you can actually solve the problem? It's those sorts of things, being closer to the person with a problem those are the skills that I think are going to be really important in the future. Um, and paradoxically, on the other end of the spectrum, I worry that we will lose touch with how these systems work under the hood. Mm. So there's a story, and I don't want to accuse any, any, any one of this, but what with the advent of apps on our phone, we've kind of lost the understanding of how folders work on a file system, right? How to, how to solve files. Yeah. So we just got an app, and the app's got stuff, and off we go. Um, and I've observed some of our, our, our younger grads struggling with the, with the file system concept. And it's important for us to, while we're working in these abstract places and we're working to be close to our clients, we still need to understand fundamentally how these systems work. Because if we don't understand how the systems work, we can't change them. Hmm. And if we can't change them, we can't improve them. And then we will stagnate. The systems might improve, but we will stagnate. Um, and I, I think about um, another short story, um, The Time Machine. Um, I think it was H.G. Wells. Mm -hmm. They're talking about the Eloy and the Malakoy, and there was, a, you know, um, humankind had split into two um, two species, as it were, the species who knew how the systems work, who, who who made sure the machinery worked, and the species who didn't understand how anything worked. And I don't want us to become like that. Um, I think we need to remain grounded in understanding how the technology works, while also realizing that our place is in the empathy part of it and understanding the customer's needs. Excellent. Excellent. Very, very nice insights there, Stephen. Stephen, thank you so much for your time today. I hope you'll stay on for just a couple more minutes after this, um, this sure. call is over. But on behalf of all of us, um, really appreciate your insights. Very rewarding. Thank you. Thank you.